Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. This is Sunday School for August 9th, 2020. The topic is hearing and doing the word. The Bible basis is found in James chapter 1 verses 19 through 27. The Bible truth says James instructs believers to live their lives in accordance with God's word. The memory verse says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. The Bible also says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The lesson aim says, by the end of the lesson, we will realize the proof of wisdom is not just in what we say, but what we do. Express compassion for those who are most vulnerable and desire to act on their behalf and engage in ministry that demonstrates the religion that James describes. The life need for today's lesson says, people read and talk about doing good, but find it difficult to help the most vulnerable in society. How is righteousness accomplished? According to James, righteousness is achieved by hearing and doing the word of God. The Bible learning says, God demands that we behave in a way that honors him and helps others. The Bible also says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Students will be known as a people who love God, exhibit patience, listen to God's word, and care for the vulnerable in society. The student's response says, Believers will understand that becoming more like Christ necessitates a firm commitment to reading and understanding God's word and putting our beliefs into action. The Bible says that we, in patience, we possess our souls. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that the word also says, if you love him, keep his commandments. Now let's look at the lesson scripture. James chapter 1 verses 19 through 27. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, before we begin the lesson, let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And this talks about the wise man building on a rock. This goes hand in hand with the lesson as we're talking about hearing and doing the word. The Bible says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, 
for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. So, you have to hear the word to walk in faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says the just live by faith. And we also walk by faith and not by sight. The scripture also talks about the parable of the sower. The the seed that is received into good ground is the one that brings forth the some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And that's Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. So the, the lesson begins with light on the word, widows and orphans. In the Mosaic law, special regard was given to widows and orphans. They were partly dependent on family, especially the eldest son, who received a double portion of the inheritance. They also participated in the third type of tithe, which occurred every three years, in gleaning produce in the field and in religious feasts. God proclaimed himself married to the widow and orphan and condemned those who oppressed them. The New Testament church continued to support widows through Paul, though Paul instructed that the younger ones remarry. Now this says, The introduction says, an appeal to godly living. James, the half-brother of Jesus, was among the early leaders of the church and was based in Jerusalem. Although the epistle of James is placed toward the end of the New Testament, it is actually the first letter of instruction written to the church. Thus, the first book written, the primary audience for this epistle was Christian Jews spread across the world due to persecution in Jerusalem and Rome because of their faith in Christ. The major theme of James's letter was to offer instruction for godly living in the midst of a self-indulgent world. This letter is viewed as a book of wisdom and instruction for Jewish believers. James appealed for his fellow believers to put outward actions with their inward faith. Scholars believe that James wrote this epistle in the mid-40s AD, around the time of the council in Jerusalem. He was one of the first martyrs of the church, executed in AD 62. Behaving the Word, that's James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20 we're looking at. In proverb fashion, James instructs believers to be swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to wrath. This letter was written early in the church's life. The believers are facing persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. As James offers up his instruction, he most likely bases it on a combination of wisdom scriptures, such as Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 17 and 19, and Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2. Wisdom literature was captured by scribes and passed down orally as Jews met in the synagogues and talked in their homes. James took the practicality of the Proverbs and related them to his audience, who also would have heard such lessons as they were growing up. The purpose of reviving such language and instruction in the culture of this of his day was to usher in a new era, the reign of the kingdom of God, with wisdom from the old. He takes the time to remind them in the midst of persecution and rejection to be patient, seek God for his wisdom, trust God in the midst of trials, and act honorably to best represent their faith in Christ. 
also because his audience was scattered abroad and this letter was most likely written in Greek, James suspects that these believers might be influenced away from their Jewish roots. James began by acknowledging that the ones to whom he was writing were also children of God, the Father and righteous judge. Therefore, there existed a bond of love between him and them. It is from that sense of love that James admonished the believers to remember to hear the word of God that had already been entrusted to them so that they would not fall under his judgment. James knew that a zealot like fervor for rebellion was sweeping throughout the region, and many were being influenced by its call for violence against Rome. He did not want those who followed Christ to be caught up in the hostility and anger to, in the same manner as those who did not belong to the risen Lord. God's word is powerful. It has the ability to change hearts and affect character, but it should not be shared hastily with others until it works in the hearer, until works it works in the hearer is evident. James also admonished believers to be slow to wrath, any violent emotion, especially anger, so that by their lives and actions, they would demonstrate that a different message was at work in their hearts. James understood that man's anger inhibits the development of God's righteous work within him. Anger demonstrates that our faith is put somewhere else other than God. When we react angrily, we show that some other law is at work in our hearts. Remember, God is in control. James reminds believers that these teachings should influence their behavior. He also incorporates Jesus' teachings on how to handle mistreatment and anger, and that is found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 41, and also verse 47. James reminds readers that anger does not produce the righteous living that God desires from his people. It does not work in our favor or God's when we are unable to control our emotions. God is patient and long-suffering with us, therefore we must do the same for others. Jesus himself said that offense will come, but it takes the wisdom of God to remain spirit-led in the midst of adversity and trials. When we apply the principles James outlines to our behavior, being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, Remembering that anger does not produce what God desires, then we can make good decisions, keep our relationships intact, and glorify God. Living by the Word James continues his discourse by providing additional instruction on managing one's emotions. He appeals to readers to put away worldly lifestyles and behaviors to welcome with humility and gladness the word of God that had been planted inside them by the Holy Spirit. He emphasizes that it is by receiving the truth as revealed through Jesus Christ that souls are saved. As the word of God is planted into hearts, it brings about transformation into true kingdom living and God's way, ways of doing and being. Similarly, Paul wrote that Christians are not to be influenced or live by the patterns and dictates of the world system, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds as found in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2. Only then can we know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Likewise, James, whose letter was a forerunner to Paul's writings, instructs believers to live above reproach. It was important to the early church leaders that Christians lived counter to their culture so as to best represent the power of God on earth. Key to a successful reflection of God's love and grace is to bear the fruit of the Spirit as found in Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 23. To be doers of the word and not hearers only, 
means to put the engrafted word of God into practical application. James said that if we are hearers of the word and not doers, we only deceive ourselves. James uses an illustration to further drive home his point of how one can engage in self-deception about righteous living. Evil flows from within us and expresses itself in our actions toward others. James instructed the believers to put off all filthiness, defilement, or dishonor as though it were a dirty, useless garment. The work of, a, of righteousness would then begin to show itself and help to empower the believers to hold in, check their abundance. Malignity, malice, will, desire to injure, such a state can only be accomplished in believers when they welcome the word of God with true humility. God's word then attaches itself to the very core fabric of our being and begins the work of transforming our evil nature into one pleasing to our righteous God and Savior. James's admonition for believers is to demonstrate to others how the word of God is at work within them. They are to do this by the way they live before others and by making a habit of doing the word. Living out the word of God in this fashion also provides evidence for the believers that they are not pretending or playing at being righteous, thereby deluding themselves. James offers the analogy of one looking at his face in a mirror. The best mirrors of the day were made out of Corinthian brass, but the image reflected back was often distorted. It would have been easy then for the individual to look at the reflection of the face he has had since birth, but then turn away and forget what he looked like or what he had become. James contrasts the natural man with the spiritual man. The word of God which produces the spiritual man perfects the law and sets man free from his sinful nature or natural self. But in order for the word of God to have its desired effect, believers need to continue it in that word. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The act of gazing intently into the word of God enables believers to retain the image of what the Holy Spirit is producing within them. The blessing for the believer is founded upon the actions that flow from the changed life that is the product of the Holy Spirit's work. This blessing manifests itself in the deeds of the believer that are a result of having built inwardly upon the solid ground of the word of God. James describes filthiness as a dirty piece of clothing we need to shed in order to be clothed in the righteousness of God. James encourages believers to always be transformed by the word of God, conforming to the standard of God, our lives should look more and more like the life of Christ as we continue to engage with the Word of God. When a person looks in a mirror, he or she sees an image for a moment, but when away from the mirror, the image is forgotten. The Word of God is our mirror to remind us that without Christ, our image is out of focus. Only when we look in the mirror of the Word and see the righteousness of Christ are we reminded what we are supposed to look like. The Word of God reminds us that we are in Christ, but still growing into the knowledge of Him, which requires us to be diligent to study, fervent in prayer, and quick to obey. James went on to say that those who look into the perfect law of liberty, which is freedom in Christ, will live by the word and be blessed. James defined what real religion looks like for his audience by, pro for his audience by providing two contrasting images. 
He said that those who proclaim to be devout in their beliefs and actions but are unable to control their mouths only deceive themselves. James emphasized that religion that does not reflect God's heart is in vain. In other words, it is not enough to give outward expressions of devotion to God when one's lifestyle does not reflect one's words. Attending church every Sunday, paying tithes and serving in ministry should be done out of loving obedience to God and in gratitude for salvation through Jesus Christ. But it is all for nothing if there is no true transformation of the heart. Our works should express our love and reverence and not be a mere duty. God does not want us to pay lip service to loving him. He wants our love to be genuine and thus expressed in how we live and what we do. James further explains that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. The Bible says also, stand fast in the, the liberty that God has called you, and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. For James' true religion is evidenced by this fruit that religion produces in the individual. A true believer, one who has permitted the word of God to take root within themselves, will not be like the zealots who made uncontrolled and impassioned speeches against Roman occupation. Instead, that person will bridle, bridle it to hold in check or restrain his tongue. The word that James used for religious refers to giving scrupulous attention to the details of worship. This would include being careful of one's actions and one's speech when involved in religious activities. However, if one does not control his tongue when not engaged in religious activities, then that individual is only deceiving his own heart. The center and seat of a spiritual life for that individual religion is in vain, which means his religion is useless and of no purpose. James closes his counsel by explaining to believers that the type of religion that pleases God is both pure, free from corrupt desire, sin and guilt, and undefiled, free from deformity and debasement, having full force and vigor. The evidence that one possesses a religion that merits God's favor is found through the actions of caring for the fatherless and widows in times of distress, actions that reflect the work of the Holy Spirit on one's character by encouraging believers to show concern for widows and the fatherless james reminds them that their heavenly father identified himself as the god of the fatherless and the widow widows and orphans are among the most vulnerable in society god places a high emphasis on caring for the vulnerable his people ought to be the ones who are taking care of these people God is always intentional in wanting his people to live selflessly by caring for the needs of others. Showing mercy to those who are marginalized is true religion, devotion to God in practice. In the culture of the early church, those who had no one to care for them had no means to move out of their social station. The love of God is so great that he made provision for them through those called by his name. God always commanded his people to care for the least, and Jesus was intentional to bring his ministry to the poorest of the population. James closed this part of the discourse by stressing that believers should keep themselves unspotted from the world, not allowing the world's way of living to be their marker. Only through active participation with the Holy Spirit can one live a life that is unspotted, unstained from the world. As Christians, we are not to live according to the world's standards, which run contrary to the word of God. Instead, we are to reflect the living word, Jesus Christ, who came to do the will of him who sent him. At one time or another, we are all guilty of only talking a good game. 
when it comes to living according to godly principles, representing the best of Christ in our sphere of influence, being concerned about the world around us, and having great intentions on being more helpful to those in need. In today's lesson, James calls us to not just be hearers of the word, but also to carry it out in our everyday lives in word, thought, and deed. Oftentimes we can get stuck because there is so much to be done. It can be an overwhelming task to change the world, let alone ourselves. When we embrace change in baby steps, taking one action at a time and doing it consistently, transformation takes place. Really listen for God's instruction through the preached word and in your time of personal devotion and Bible study. Take time to be quiet before the Lord and write down what he is speaking to you through the Holy Spirit. As you listen, take steps to move in God's direction. Make a conscious effort to assess habits, behaviors, and actions that do not line up with the word of God. Repent and ask the Holy Spirit to help you act differently. Be patient with yourself. Trust God. Trust that God heard you and that his word will change your heart if you yield to his way. The prayer is, Father, we thank you for your word, which helps us see where, where we fall short in our daily lives. Help us to be a people who live life in accordance with your word and will, and help us to be people who put their faith into practice. Give us eyes to see those who are suffering around us so we can serve them better. Give us wisdom as we seek to be quick to listen and slow to speak. We pray that our actions would align with what you clearly have taught us in Scripture. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Here is one more scripture I'm going to speak to you. It is found in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 through 19. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. God bless you and thank you for joining me today.